Our TMC Health Policy Institute sessions on health policy issues. And tonight we're going to be talking about the public health system. We've uh, gathered uh, an esteemed panel, and we have a wonderful moderator, um, Raquel Roberts, who's the director of the Office of Policy and Planning at Harris County Health Department. Among other things, as you'll see in the bio, she's also a doctoral candidate at the UT School of Public Health. Raquel, please. Thank you, Dr. Linder. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Well, about a year ago or so, um, I was um, able to serve as moderator for the inaugural series of um, uh, the, the Texas Policy um, Institute's policy course, and um, I'm just glad to be back. Excuse me, I'm glad to be back, and uh, I look forward to future um, this conversation today. Essentially, uh, so it's a privilege to serve as your moderator for this amazing panel that we have here tonight. Um, tonight, we get to talk about public health which is essentially an ecosystem of players who collectively create the conditions in which people can be healthy. So without giving too much away, um, I do want to just briefly touch on what the system is just to kind of open things up and, and frame this conversation. It's a system of many players. So obviously there's health in the system, but there's also housing and education and agriculture and emergency management and, and so many others to name a few. It also operates on multiple levels. So think about where public health might be in your neighborhood, um, the city that you live in, the county that you live in, um, the state that you live in, this nation, and then even globally. It stands on the premise that health happens where we live, learn, work, worship, and play. So I'd like to begin by just introducing you to our esteemed panel here today. Um, everyone on the panel actually represents uh, local leaders that comprise our local public health system. So I'd like to start with Dr. Patricia Galbray. She is the founding director of the Bridge Up at Menninger at the Menninger Clinic. She's an adjunct assistant professor at UT School of Public Health and managing director for Westlake Health Consulting. There's many areas of expertise that she has, uh, obviously public health, but also philanthropy, uh, mental health, social change, and justice, especially in vulnerable communities. To her left is Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham is the president and CEO of the Institute for Spirituality and Health at the Texas Medical Center. In his career, he has been both a physician and a priest. Among his many accomplishments and roles, he was a founding member of the board of directors of St. Luke's Episcopal Health Charities. He's the author of two books, one of which sounds very intriguing, Mold Me and Shape Me. Both of them I'd say pretty intriguing. But what really caught my attention is the book Graham Crackers and Milk, Food for the Heart and Soul. And to his left is Allison Winnicky. She's the president and CEO of the Immunization Partnership. She's, she is also an adjunct professor at the University of Houston Law Center in their Health Law and Policy Institute. She also serves as a fellow at UT School of Public Health. And uh, her areas of expertise not only include public health, but also emergency preparedness and response, immunization law and policy, uh, health legislative drafting, health information technology, and smoking and tobacco related laws. One of our speakers, uh, Dr. Umer, Umer, excuse me, um, I don't know why, I, I did this a year ago, didn't I? Because I always call him Dr. Shaw. Um, he's who I uh, work for. He is the executive director of Harris County Public Health, and he'll be here shortly. Um, so just stay tuned for, uh, for when he does get here, we'll get started um, in the meantime with a brief 
a little exercise here with using poles everywhere. So Adele, if you can help me out here. So this is just a little something to get us warmed up. Um, so can everyone see the screen, or is anyone having any trouble getting connected with your phone? I, th I think we're good. All right, so the question is, between healthcare and public health, what percentage of US health spending does healthcare versus public health receive? So I'll give you a few minutes to answer that question. Okay, it looks like we've got a figure that's running in the lead. There's numbers still coming. Do we have most responses? Anybody else still working on it? Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and it looks like we've got healthcare at 95% and public health at about 5% running in the lead, and I am pleased to say that that is the correct answer, so give yourself a hand. So it's kind of correct. It's, the, it's like the closest to correct answer. Um, so if we were really to be spot on, it would be closer to actually 97% compared to more like 3% in healthcare. So big difference, right? So let's go to the next question. <coughs> Okay, so when you think of your daily health, what are the top five things you immediately think of? Be honest. So you've got to look at the full list, too. So it looks like we've got most responses in. And if we were to look at the top five, the first one that pops out, lifestyle choices, followed by mental well-being, air quality and immunizations run um, a strong third, meditation and spiritual well-being would run next, and then there's a few that come 
they're tied. So doctors, water quality checks, neighborhood structures, and sidewalks. So I'm getting the sense that this audience is a little public health friendly. Because <laughs> when we set this up, we were thinking that it's going to be heavy on the healthcare side. So good. Yeah. Kudos to you all on that one. So thank you for participating in that exercise. So we just need to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so again, with our esteemed pa panel here, uh, we again want to talk about what public health is, might need to also set the, st the stage for how it's different compared to healthcare. Um, so would any of you like to take that question first? Um, I, I'd be happy to, to kick, off, kick it off. Um, so to me, how I differentiate those two terms, or when I think about healthcare, I think about an individual patient and an individual person's needs that are met somehow through the healthcare system. Um, and you can think of it as like an acute issue, like a broken elbow or a chronic issue or things like that, but it's one person and their particular issues. Now, when I think about public health, it's a collective term. It's the health of some population as a whole. And so it can be global, it can be national, it can be state, it can be neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about one person, we're talking about a group of people and what we can do to make sure that their health as that group, however it's defined, is of a high quality. That's good. I think that's excellent. Would anyone else like um, to chime in on that one? Well, I would like to say that uh, I think uh, for the health issues are really about, we're thinking of diseases, but I think when we think of public health, we're thinking of preventive medicine, preventing those diseases, and what do we need to do along the way to minimize the likelihood that they're going to occur. So I see public health as preventative medicine where we have sort of, if you will, the backup where I trained as a physician, uh, we, we were there when the disease happened, and that was after the fact. I like to think about public health as um, when it works, it's invisible. And uh, when we have problems like with air pollution or Zika virus or West Nile or something like that, then public health becomes a part of the way people think about health. I think most people think about it in the clinical aspect like my colleagues have said, it's more about the clinical uh, aspects of our health care, treatment, and, um, and you know, cures and making us well. Whereas population health is really about creating together, all of us, a society where we can be as healthy as we can be. And I, I love it for that reason. I am concerned, however, the first time I came here was the night they served dinner, mm -hmm. and this, this room was, oh, that wall was completely open, and tonight, we just have our little public health group here, don't we? <laughs> it's not because we're not serving dinner, right? <laughs> Dr. Shaw just walked in. Um, it's also online, so people are taking advantage of that as well. Oh, okay. Yes, that is correct. Okay, got it. And one thing I'll add that kind of ties in what we talked about is um, something that you've probably seen in the news. There's been another case of um, um, a person with HIV and they did a stem cell transplant. Um, and this is the second time ever where they've not been able to detect any of the virus. Well, that's really going the full clinical route of treatment of a disease. But what we care about in public health is that prevention part at the front end. How can we prevent the population from contracting this virus? And, but once they do, and then they move into that healthcare system, and then you have all of these very expensive interventions, um, and such as that one that's just been in the news this week. Uh, thank you, Allison. And you know, it, the the very interesting thing is that you all represent really different aspects of this larger system. I'm curious that, uh, or, or curious to know how 
um, integrated, do you feel, from a spiritual perspective, a mental health perspective, um, the legal perspective, how that combines with um, just the system, how that interplays across the system as a whole? Um, are we are you finding greater convergence, or are we operating too much in silos? What are your thoughts on that? I have a thought. Now, I want to mention that Dr. Shaw came to the Institute for Spirituality and Health, had a beautiful presentation on social determinants of health, and we've been working very closely with, uh, with Harris County Public Health, and uh, it's been a real revelation to me, all of the work and that is accomplished, and... Uh, we feel like we're a small part of that. I would like to say, before Dr. Shaw gets the opportunity to speak, I would like to say that probably we're not quite aware uh, in the public the importance of spirituality. That's, of course, where I am at the Institute, and I would like to mention how important that is. There are many studies in the medical literature showing a positive correlation between your spirituality and your health and even your longevity. Uh, that would surprise a lot of people. But uh, in fact, uh, I am, now when we say spirituality, I'm talking about a broader term than just um, religion. I'm talking about a lifestyle, some of the things that were on the board a moment ago. I'm talking about a lifestyle that includes uh, physical exercise, also includes uh, all that it means for you to be creative, uh, all that includes music, arts, dance, anything in your life that adds. I, I would say whatever spirituality is, whatever turns you on, makes you come alive, makes you fully human. And certainly, um, here's my definition of spirituality, and I'll quit talking. To me, spirituality is how is that? It's that innate ability that you and I have to connect, to connect to other people to connect to our environment, to connect to our creatures of our environment, our dogs, cats, pets, <laughs> and to connect, if you will, to that transcendent mystery that many of us call God or Allah or Krishna, or perhaps we do not want to name this mystery, but we do stand in awe of the universe. And that, uh, to me, sets you up to experience Three things that um, a professor um, in, at Washington University has come up with that will give us a sense of well-being. The first one is we need to be able to make to know that we can make a difference. It's called self-affirmation. We all need that. Secondly, we need to know we can't do that alone. We work with the group. We're not a lone ranger. And the third thing is that we have an understanding of self-transcendence, that there's something greater than ourselves that, in fact, we can participate with. And the interesting thing about the study was you need all three. And if you're deficient in any one of them, you have less, of, more, less likely to have a sense of well-being. Okay, I'm going to quit talking for the moment. <laughs> And Dr. Shaw, no, you've got you to talk about that, Dr. Graham. Yeah. Dr. Shaw, you know, Dr. Bray actually was talking a little bit earlier about the invisibility crisis of public health. Um, so like minds on the panel here. So can you talk a little bit about that from your perspective as the, the health department director for Harris County Public Health? Sure. Thanks, Raquel. And thank you for, uh, oh, geez, that's pretty loud. It's all right. Uh, they'll, they'll handle it. Okay. Thank you for, um, for having me uh, be a part of this. And I want to start with an apology for, for running behind. Um, uh, apparently, there's something called Google Maps and uh, Garcia Maps, Garcia being my assistant, who told me when to leave and also which direction to take. And I ignored both of them to go a separate way to assume that I could get from the gallery to the medical center in ample time. And apparently, I should have listened to both or either because obviously I didn't quite make it on time. So that is where Shaw Maps comes in. And obviously, it does, it's not going to, uh, from a proprietary standpoint, anybody can take it. It's not going to be very effective. Um, I really, first of all, I just want to say thank you for being here on an evening. Uh, we know there, there's so many things that are, that are happening across this great community of ours. It's just wonderful to, to really see all of you and many familiar faces and folks that we know and certainly others that uh, we hope to know. Um, Raquel, as, as has mentioned, is from 
the, the real public health perspective, we really believe very strongly that at the end of the day that health really is about prevention. It's really what we do to, and we lately have been using the words uh, or the word investment that we believe that public health and prevention and, and really truly health is an investment in a community's well-being, its resilience, its, its real overall the buzzword of health. Um, the challenge is that's not where we put our money. Uh, we put our money in healthcare delivery, um, sick care, people get injured, they're somehow traumatized, something happens, they get into the disease care system. And so what I really, uh, and I mentioned this last night at a, at a lecture at Rice University, which is that um, uh, Harvey Feinberg, as many of you know or may not know, he's a, a, a one of the real stalwarts in public health uh, at Harvard University School of Public Health. I really uh, penned this back in 1999 in this real article that was landmark of public health versus medicine. And the real term was public health versus medicine. And I, I completely agree with everything he was saying except for the, the, the yeah. term versus. It's yeah. not an either or, it's an and. And we really need to make sure that public health and prevention and what we do up front is equally valued as is healthcare delivery. We can't do our job unless the healthcare delivery system is strong and the healthcare delivery system cannot do its job unless the public health system is strong. And yet, as we value things across the system, we actually spend markedly more in the healthcare delivery system, uh, essentially when a, um, a car goes into the repair shop rather than the, the, the maintenance of the oil changes to ensure that the car never gets into that healthcare delivery system. And that's what really public health is all about. So thank you for that, Dr. Shaw. Um, now, where do you see perhaps public health in its intersection with mental health and spiritual health and perhaps even the law? Sure. You looking at me? Okay. <laughs> you're, you're the intersection in between the two of us. There you go. <laughs> the bridge. Well, when I first met Dr. Shaw, I was uh, the generalist, the public health generalist. And in the last three or four years, I've been uh, quickly becoming uh, a specialist in, uh, in what we now call behavioral health. And um, I work with the Menninger Clinic, and uh, dis we, we set up a new center that is all about prevention of mental health disorders. And I would invite you to think about what that means. Uh, that's a very tricky term. I was telling somebody earlier that Back in the day, it's been about 10 years ago, when we were at St. Luke's, we tried to do something. I think it was Raquel was just telling me this, that we were trying to do something around the um, idea of what happens when we think about prevention in the terms of behavioral health or mental health. And what does that mean? And I think that we did a lot of things wrong back then. We didn't have a method. We didn't have a model. We didn't have an approach. We had the wrong people on the bus. And we had the wrong bus, and we had the wrong community <laughs> because we were trying to listen to the community, but we weren't able to guide the community to help us to come to some ideas about what interventions would look like. And so it's just kind of luck that when we started the Bridge Up Center at the Menninger Clinic, it was, uh, we did a lot of background on what that would look like. And at, in 2015, you might remember that President Obama had uh, passed a legislation that was replacing the No Child Left Behind. And this is very important because that new legislation is Each Student Succeeds Act. And in that act is one very important feature. And that feature is that for students, when we think about their health and well being and academic achievement, we must think about their skill sets around behavior around empathy and relationships and all of these things that people call soft skills and we call it non-cognitive. And so in ESSA, we were able and schools are able now to put into place ideas, curricula, and all kinds of models to, to help to teach our kids 
K, pre-K through 12th grade and over, how to think about these things. How do we make responsible decisions? How do we, how do we teach our kids about social and emotional learning? And so that is my expertise now, and that's the intersection. The good thing about it is that it is, it is rooted in public health theory. And I'll get to some of that later, but it had to be because that's what I love the most. And I'm trained in public health. And, um, and so it, it, it's just really exciting to see the intersections of some of these ideas and some of these disciplines coming together, public health, education, and mental health or behavioral health. So I'll stop there for, for now. Thank you, Dr. Bray. And I, and I can speak a little bit about the intersection of public health and the law, and that's the area that I specialize in. Is, and, and as I mentioned earlier, because we're talking about population health, whatever the jurisdiction is, we're talking about everybody. And so you can imagine how laws have a really big impact. If you compare it particularly with the health care delivery system, a lot of the laws related to the health care delivery system are really about sort of like licensure of providers, making sure that, you know, folks are properly credentialed so you can go and visit them on an individual basis. But when we're talking about the public health system, we're really talking about the government has a responsibility and the authority to protect all of our health, everyone who is part of our community, whether it's at the local, state, or federal level. And so that's why you see public health laws at all of those levels. And like we saw in the quiz um, at the beginning, things like restaurant inspections, um, mosquito control, things that aren't necessarily very sexy or things that we forget about, but they're vitally important. And that's part of the infrastructure that, and the investment that you heard about from Dr. Shaw is that um, people don't think about sort of putting pennies away to sort of keep that infrastructure going. But once that infrastructure breaks down, the whole you know, public health ecosystem starts breaking down. And so that's why it's so important to invest in that. And that's also why it's important to make sure that we have really good public health laws that look at the science and what's the best um, evidence-based um, policies that can be implemented to protect everyone's health, to make sure there's safeguards in account, make sure that the right people, so like we have local health authorities, like Dr. Shaw is a local health authority here for Harris County, um, have the power to take action when there's any kind of emergency or outbreaks and things like that. And so keeping our public health law system strong and robust and um, to be able to respond to any kind of threats um, is, is really important. Thank you. And so, Allison, um, you touched on investment. Uh, Dr. Shaw, you touched on investment as well. Can you expand a little bit more on um, sort of the, the current and the, the current funding environment and what that really means for public health. What um, maybe some challenges and how does funding really um, play a role in really trying to operationalize um, action when there is a disaster or uh, some sort of public health threat to our communities? Well, one thing I can say is it, it's poor. We're not good at funding public health. Um, you don't get a shiny new building out of it or something cool um, to show off. It's, it's kind of boring sometimes. And it's the same issue that you have with infrastructure, with roads and things like that. People don't want to put in that investment. And so when you saw the poll numbers earlier and it's like 97%. So healthcare spending is almost 20% of our GDP for the US, which is, so I mean, it covers pretty much anything money-wise is connected somewhere to healthcare. And out of that huge chunk of trillions of dollars, only 3% of it is put towards public health, which is really all about prevention. <laughs> and we really, and, and that's the part, one thing, you know, talking with um, up in, in DC in Congress where they do a lot of funding and in Austin and things like that, I'll tell you, public health is so easy to cut the funding for. Why? Because it's so good and so effective. And people forget that and they don't realize it. And it's a victim of its own success. 
So they think, oh, you must be doing well. You don't need this extra tobacco prevention money or whatever. And so then they take it away and they're always trying to trim it and then put the money towards more urgent things. And when you put that in the context of what we were talking about between, um, you know, health care issues and prevention issues, it's like, well, we have an emergency today and let's put the money towards that. And then it continues to erode the public health issue. So that's a, a big pet peeve for me is to try to make sure that our policymakers really understand the value of public health and they put their money where you get the most bang for your buck because you get the most bang for your buck out of those prevention dollars. So, and I completely agree with you, Allison. Uh, what, I would, what I would say is a, a few things. One is that, um, I, I think you mentioned the comment uh, or the term invisibility. Um, so I've actually gone as far as on, it was actually trending on Twitter. Um, so I was really excited about that, in a good way, not lately what's been <laughs> trending on Twitter when you look at the Twitter feeds related to uh, some things that were happening over the last 24 hours, um, was, it was really the hashtag invisibility crisis, that we do have this crisis in public health, and um, it is really a challenge that really gets to the heart of everything that my panel, co-panelists have, have just mentioned, which is how do we bring light to this? Um, when we think of public health, we oftentimes do forget the importance and the value. And so, um, of course, um, my daughter reminded me of this just last night that I think of metaphors and a lot of acronyms, and I need to stop doing that uh, <laughs> because it's easy for her, but it's not easy for other people, and I need to grow up. So that was given that comment. So I apologize to her in advance because I'm about to go back on what she told me last night not to do any further, um, is that I really see public health as the offensive line of a football team. And we are in Texas, and so obviously football is big. Not that everybody likes football, but uh, it is big enough that folks recognize that that offensive line is really very important to who's standing behind the line, and that's usually the quarterback. And the quarterback is, um, and you can replace the quarterback or, or the, the nomenclature with healthcare delivery, or the quarterback is EMS, or the quarterback is law enforcement, or the quarterback is, and just fill in the blanks. But the quarterback is really, if you look at the Texans, right, everybody knows Deshaun Watson. Everybody knows on the Patriots, Tom Brady. But I would argue that if I asked, very few people in the room would be able to raise a hand and actually name one of the offensive linemen for either of the Texans or for the Patriots, even though the quarterback cannot do his or her job unless that offensive line is strong. So the nameless, quiet folks that are invisible are really public health, and public health is that offensive line. Where the metaphor breaks down is that in football, what we do is when you have a fantastic game or a fantastic season, you win the Super Bowl, Tom Brady you know, is, is holding that. By the way, that's another issue, right? Tom Brady is holding the, uh, the Super Bowl, um, both the ring but also the, the trophy. At the end of the day, everybody says the quarterback won that game for us or that had that season for us. And everybody is giving notoriety there. But in football, what we do is, if it's because of that offensive line, what do we also do is we invest in the offensive line. We make sure we don't gut it. We make sure that Tom Brady stays upright or Deshaun Watson can throw the next touchdown. We invest in the offensive line. Here's where the metaphor breaks down. In public health, we do the opposite. So tuberculosis rates go down. What do we do? We don't need public health anymore, so we stop investing. Measles rates or vaccine-preventable vaccine disease rates go down. We don't need public health. Or restaurant inspections, really, we haven't had an outbreak, so we don't need infrastructure of sanitarians. What happens? All of a sudden, you have an increase in those diseases or those potential for diseases. That is a big challenge in public health, is that when we are largely doing our job, it's behind scenes. And that's where the investment really comes in. So the hashtag invisibility crisis, we believe very, very quickly, is solved by three Vs of public health, which you raise the visibility, 
When you raise visibility and people see the visible work you're doing, then it shows or demonstrates value. When you have value, then it goes to the third V, which is validation, which is pro-health policies or pro-health investments that really get to the heart of raising the investment profile for what's happening in public health. We believe at our department that we're starting to get to that point. Um, but I'll tell you, it's a really difficult conversation. Allison, you made this comment just a, a couple of minutes ago about Congress. Uh, so I was giving a congressional testimony, my team knows this, uh, just a, a, a couple of weeks ago. And in the congressional testimony, there were two sides of the argument. One side was, well, in order to to do something and in, in, in the way families and even fed, they were doing the, the analogy of federal government with families, in order to raise revenue, in, in order to have an intact uh, system in terms of uh, the checks and balances, you raise revenue or you decrease expenses. And that's what, that was the, the argument of two sides and, and they was really just raise revenue, decrease expenses. And I kept hearing this for an hour, hour and a half. Raise revenue, decrease expenses. And actually, in theory, in, in reality, that is true. But there's a third way of looking at it, which is that it's not just about raising revenue and decreasing expenses or decreasing expense. It's actually investing. So a family oftentimes will take a dollar today and put it into an investment so that at the end of the year, it'll be $100. Or in the end of four years, it's going to be a college education for their child or at the end of two years, it's going to be a car that they can now afford for, for their family. That's an investment. So even though it's a dollar expended today, it's an investment to the future. The big challenge that we have is that people and, and entities and, and officials oftentimes look at public health as an expenditure and not an investment in a community's health. And that's what we're trying to do is change that narrative. Could I, could I mention, <clears throat> Hurricane Harvey, everybody gave a lot of money, a lot of philanthropic individuals in Houston gave a tremendous amount of money. J.J. Watts sure. brought, brought in a lot of money. What do you see um, the role, you know, of not just governmental funded, but what about the public funded, public health efforts that's going on? Like, for instance, we... We trained 120 people <clears throat> in what we call mind-body skills mm -hmm. to manage stress. They went out into the community and trained 4,000 people. In, in, in other words, how to handle the stress they were going through as a result of Hurricane Harvey, losing their homes and all of that. I, do, I just wondered if you, if you see the role of the, of the, that there is a role going on also is in the public arena outside of, say, just the formal public health. Absolutely, and I think, you know, we'll, uh, we, we talk a lot about governmental public health, but we also say that at the end of the day, it's a partnership thing. Governmental public health has a role of responsibility, as Allison mentioned, as, 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 as Gail has mentioned, that we know that that's what governmental public health is about, but governmental public health cannot be effective unless it has partnership with those st other stakeholders, those other partners in government, not in government, and particularly with the community. And yeah. so really ensuring that we have a way to think about and implement strategies that's not yeah. just about us going at it alone, yeah. but it's never the me, yeah. it's the we of how do we solve issues. Yeah. And so an example is animal related, right? So what we say all the time is that we have a problem with stray dogs in our community right, stray animals. The obvious question is, well, what are you government gonna do about it? And the answer that I like to come back always is, what are we going to do about it? What are we gonna do together to solve that issue? And that's really what Hurricane Harvey was all about. So when J.J. Watt came with 200,000 and was able to raise 37 million, yeah. now all of a sudden yeah. you've got another player in the, in the entire spectrum that's it. As long as those dollars are now being used in a, in a, a you know, responsible way and certainly yeah. in a way that's going to allow to advance the health or the well-being of that community, then obviously those are things that, that yeah. really help the entire system. We found there are, I'm sure you know this, that there are seven underserved areas in Houston that 
uh, really are missing out. Of course, they're the impoverished areas. Um, do you have, do we have an ongoing plan of how we will address those? I'm thinking of your, your social determinants of health where it depends on where you, your zip code is, how healthy you are to start with, it seems like. Um, what, what is the government, and what, what is its role and what is our role as, as public to be very aware of these underserved areas in our own community right down the street, perhaps? It's not that far away, another zip code over. From a health standpoint, I, and I, I do want to hear what, you know, Gail, you have to say, and Allison, what you have to say about this, is from a governmental perspective, from a governmental public health perspective, what I would say is that it is our responsibility and our role to actually raise the awareness and be the voice of communities. And we know the Harris County community of 4.7 million people, third largest in the, in the country, spread over the size of Rhode Island, is incredibly diverse and different. And so there are communities a part of that larger community. And our job in public sector is to be the voice of those communities as we also remember that the entire community is really who we're responsible for. And that, that's the way I look at it. And you know, obviously there, there, there are some ways to look around the, the margins, but I don't know if you and Allison have additional thoughts about that. Oh, definitely. This is, this is a, a, in the, a, I guess you guys got the information about the reading material. I don't know if you read about Public Health 3.0 and then what the county's done about it. That was really wonderful to, to be reminded of the Public Health 3.0. So if you haven't read it and you haven't read what his uh, department, uh, his Harris County Public Health Department's done with it, it's worth a read. And uh, I, I really- Shameless plug. Yeah, it is a <laughs> shameless plug. I'm gonna get closer plug. to her. <laughs> yeah. That's really nice of her. But you, you know that the social determinants of health is a really big deal. It is a paradigm shift in our country, finally. And um, when it first became, uh, I guess, in the literature, it wasn't in the United States. It was in the UK and Canada and Australia. And we were fortunate, when John was on our board, St. Luke's, that our board chair, M. David Lowe, was the president of the University of Texas at the time. I don't know if anybody remembers him, and sadly we lost him last year. But um, he was an amazing guy for us. He, he really set us on the path of social determinant and health with public health and philanthropy. So this idea of funding, we have to expand how we think about just mosquito control or animal control or restaurant uh, cleanliness and sanitation and those, those kinds of things. It, he's telling us we have to think about health and health care in the way that the, the World Health Organization, the Commission on Social Determinants, Michael Marmot, Richard Wilkinson, all those guys um, started talking about it. And it had, when it was coming to, to Houston, nobody here knew what we were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And so now it's, it's in the public health literature, it's all over, and it is an opportunity. And it also mentions in that reading that we did about the despicable nature we have about how our funding is distributed and how inequitable that is. And to me, that is the problem. And when you're talking about the impoverished zip codes and neighborhoods, that is where we've got to come together as a community. Yeah. You know, I think uh, when you came to our institute, you put, you gave me words to express what was in our faith system already, in our hearts. Um, now, we're an inter interfaith organization, so it's a people of all faith. Uh, so, and, and everybody sort of wants you know, this is the value system that we have, and you gave words to express it with, with social determinants of health. I, I really loved that and have grabbed hold of it, and I must talk about social determinants of health once a week, at least, <laughs> because I think it's so fundamental to what we need to do. Um, I, I, I really think uh, the religious organizations have played a role in health Public health simply, if you really think about it, what you what you think and believe has a whole lot to do about your health. If you now, I'm just going to speak as someone who's been a priest for a few years. Okay, <laughs> uh, if you go to a service, a religious service, once a week, and uh, it has a hopefully it'll have a powerful sermon that 
will be will build you up, make you feel strong and you know alive, and that there's a that there is a transcendent God in the universe that cares about you. You hear beautiful music. Hopefully, you'll hear music, beautiful music. You'll be in a beautiful structure, and you're with beautiful people. That hopefully will will be a support system for you. They'll be praying for you and thinking about you. And uh, there are many studies now showing the positive uh, impact of a religious community on the life of people. So I, when we're talking about public health, I, I really want to say that the religious community has much to do with the health of the community at the very, in a way, in a preventative medicine. Also, we, we at the Institute now have, a, have an art, we are putting together a group called, uh, it's going to be called Faith Health Houston Network. Faith Health Houston Network. And what we're doing is bringing together as many faith leaders as we can, and we will be um, introducing them and, and, and exposing them to a lot of the resources they may not be aware of, um, they, they indicate they're not aware of, and have speakers go into their church settings, their religious settings, mosque, um, their temples, go into those places in order to um, share the, the health uh, issues, like, for instance, diabetes, lifestyle management of diabetes. We can do that. People can do that without, without going to the medical center itself. We can be trained to do it, and we have somebody on our staff to do it, yes. There's somebody has a hand up. Sure. So, so I was I was wondering about So thanks for mentioning the faith base, but I think that especially since uh, Gail had mentioned children, and that touches families because you know the families are also, you know, the parents get engaged. Um, have you been dealing with the Texas Healthcare or the uh, Texas Healthcare Coordinating Board or a Texas Coordinating Board that deals with the education of our future teachers, but also impacts what's in our elementary and as well as K, K through 12, where you know they look at most of the time uh, on time, fulfill commitments, not really soft skills so much, but more time management and other things so that the, the child is prepared for not dealing necessarily with team or structure. So you're dealing with, a, I forget the acronym, Texas Higher Education Coordinator, or THC, whatever that is. So are you all reaching out to them? Besides just the faith base, that could be another aggregator that could push down for educators in the, all of the universities that are funded by the state of Texas, but also all of the schools that they also look at certification. So are, are you reaching out to them as well as another aggregating effort? Thank you. We have uh, partnerships with schools in our community, and we focus, our funding comes from the David and Helen Gurley Brown Trust in New York. It's about $10 million for our center. And we uh, were charged with focusing on adolescents and giving them a bridge up. And so that means that where's the best place to, to help your kids? This, this organization is at... Right. I'm, I'm, yeah, this, I'm this trying to get to that. Yeah. state level that could potentially drive good practices relative to, right, to the educators teachers. and the universities for future teachers that would be yes. prepared for this and medical schools and other, other areas as well as <laughs> what's being implemented as curricula you know, in the K through 12 as well, yeah. kindergarten through. I appreciate that uh, plug for them because we were going with the uh, Texas Education Association and they were not as receptive. And then some of the work that's going on in Austin, for example, is putting the social emotional learning curriculum in every school in Austin ISD, 85,000 kids. They, uh, they've come up against problems with the state government uh, agencies not wanting to fund it. So, yeah. Well, that's a very, if, if, yeah, maybe we could talk later. Yeah, the way we, um, at, at our department, we're, um, we frame health in many different ways. So we have cornerstone values of innovation, engagement, equity. Those are our three cornerstone values that, that really pervade everything that we do throughout our department, our teams. Every, you know, it's really innovation, engagement, 
equity throughout. Those three cornerstone values really are married with our other framers that we have, global domestic health, really the, the, the thought about uh, one health, really looking at animal health, human health, um, vectors or, or uh, insects plus environmental health. But one framer that is that never leaves us, which has been really important for me as a journey, as John sort of described this piece as well on that social determinant side, which was um, in my career as a physician, uh, practicing physician, I used to believe that health happened just in the healthcare system. Right. Mm -hmm. I did too. Just in the hospital, just in the clinic just in the emergency department and I could go on. That's what I was trained. And by the way, I was trained at a very strong primary care institution that really believed in being in the community, et cetera, in Ohio. And that's really where I came from was that health happened in that healthcare system. And after multiple trials and tribulations and frustrations, honestly, with dealing with patients and understanding and recognizing that I was very limited by my tools of medications and, and talking to them in a very five minutes or 20 minutes of a, of a visit when really the issue was what was happening around them that has really transformed my thinking and my career and really by, by thereby our departments thinking in and really the way our, pers our department's perspective around framing health, which is that health happens where you live, where you learn, where you work, where you worship, where you play. And we really believe strongly that really implies that health happens in the community. So and so we have some all of those, schools and we have yeah. The onboarding of the new University of Houston and yeah. uh, Sam Houston State is bringing mm -hmm. in a, a new you know, medical training facility as sure. well. I would just say that that may be another place for you to start your you know, beachhead or, you know, your grassroots efforts so that trainees can go forward and then kind of demand that from the institutions that they go into so you could seed that probably through those, you know, new trainees, et cetera. Thank you both. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, we, we really also have been looking at it with working with, you know, John and faith community, but also schools. I mean, I think it's really important as we're thinking even right now about vaccinations. I mean, really working with our school health advisory groups or school health leadership groups and really the kinds of coalitions. Uh, Raquel and Gwen Sims in our Nutrition Chronic Disease Prevention Division have been very, very much uh, leaders in our Healthy Living Matters, which is an OB a childhood obesity prevention coalition. And really looking at children at the end of the day is that we really believe that my nine-year-old has a fantastic opportunity for health and well-being as does, I'm not sure about the, the four and the two-year-old, they're, they're, they're boys, so I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what they're doing. Uh, but the nine-year-old girl has an incredible opportunity to have this uh, great uh, perspective. But in all seriousness, uh, she has and has every right to that just as every other child should in our country. And we've got to really be very nimble at remembering that investing in children and the next generation and how do we develop the optimal opportunities for children to really be the next, you know, the next taker overs, if you will, of our communities, that that is really, a, at the end of the day, what it's all about. And I think that's really important for us as well as a department. I want to mention we started teaching yoga and meditation at a high school, high school for healthcare professions. And uh, the teachers say, they well, it was uh, a, a, had a cohort where they were doing that and one that you know was a control group that weren't, that there was a dramatic difference in how focused the students were that had done the meditation and the yoga compared to the others. Now this is not just here in Houston, it's been done up east as well, and I think that's where the idea came. So we did it at that one high school, and now the word is spreading, and every, every high school wants that in order to help their own students. And I, I just want to mention that as one little uh, opportunity that we have uh, at a young age to teach people how to focus, how to control their bodies, how to be a, a, a good student among, among other students, add value system. So it's one way we do it. We also had funded a couple of grants in the last couple of years that integrated mindfulness into the social emotional mm -hmm. learning in the, in the actual school, um, yeah. the curriculum. Yeah. 
And so that they learn about their own self-awareness, their social awareness, their relational capacities, because after all, it's all relational. Um, they learn a, a lot about themselves with that mindfulness training. We know yeah. from the science that that's making a big difference in the focus and in also mm -hmm. in the um, uh, ability of the child to be able to uh, enhance their own self-awareness, which I think is really important because then they can become more, think they can think more globally about others and the world that they're in. So, And, and you know, from our standpoint, it's, it's really... Uh, we, we were well known for infectious disease activities, uh, responses to emergencies, and we obviously have to continue to be strong in those areas, especially because of the community that we're in, right? Uh, hurricanes mm -hmm. and, and other emergencies seem to, you know, right, four cases of measles that were, that were just confirmed by us uh, just um, um, uh, several yeah. weeks ago. And so it's, we, we, we have all these, these really fantastic areas that we have to continue to be very strong and very critically important areas. But we also invested, I guess it was about four or five years ago, in a, in a um, new division called Nutrition and Chronic Disease Prevention, which is really about nutritional health, physical health, and mental behavioral health with the lens of addiction, especially in that area of that mental behavioral health. And from our perspective, what we know and everybody knows, although Ebola and Zika and all these other diseases get all the you know, the, the incredible amount of concern, uh, for rightfully so in many ways, um, but what's really killing most Americans, what's really impacting most Harris County residents is the scourge of chronic conditions, right? Diabetes, <coughs> high blood pressure, obesity, tobacco, I mean, go down the list. And what we really recognize is that if first, if I ask uh, folks in the audience, please raise your hand if you know somebody who had Zika. <laughs> right? Somebody who has diabetes, somebody who has hypertension, somebody who has cancer, and, mm -hmm. and the, the hands will go mental up health. and up and up, mental health, and we really see that that is something we have to invest in. And so even when we didn't have those resources, we sort of took, you know, sort of robbed Peter to pay Paul. We decided we were going to invest in this area. And our latest area is this area of uh, an Office of Science, Surveillance, and Technology, is to really to bring the science and the, and the real epidemiologic aspects into a real spectrum of looking at health department of not just yesterday or today, but really health department of tomorrow. And that's really exciting for some of the activities that we're trying to do as well. Looks like we've got a question over here, or a couple two. of questions. Wow. They both have Maybe we start with you. Oh, now we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Actually, uh, this is just uh, we started off with a quiz, um, and that was the number one thing on the quiz was people recognize lifestyle choices were the most important thing to determining health. Um, and you also mentioned that innovation in healthcare and prevention is recognized as the most important thing. So my question is, we recognize, and I think most people here recognize the importance of nutrition. Um, but they lack how exactly to eat healthy. Uh, so what I mean by that is um, they try to cut calories to cut weight, but they also feel weak. Um, they try to increase um, protein, um, but they also have high cholesterol at the same time. So it's really not about um, making, not having the right desire to make lifestyle choices, lifestyle, lifestyle choices, but having the right knowledge on how to create a balanced meal, uh, which is the challenge. Um, and I see it two ways. One, the patients themselves don't know, and I haven't seen any physician, any uh, dietitian, any health app until today that can create a custom um, health plan for an individual. Most guidelines are very generic. You go to Mediterranean diet, have more vegetables, more this. How much more? Uh, what should I cut? How much should I cut? So it has to be very specific. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, and I, I, so, since you were looking at me, I guess you were, you were asking me the question, but I'm glad I missed, I say I missed the quiz on purpose, so I wouldn't have to answer any of the questions, and now I'm in, oh, dude, now I'm in trouble. Um, what, what I would say is that um, this is why population health, public health, and what happens as a system must go hand in hand with what happens with the individual on the, on the, you know, on the ground level, if you will, and that's where healthcare delivery is important, that there is this integration, right? So as we are preaching the mantra and developing systems and, 
and ensuring that the message is out that making the default choice the healthy choice or the easy choice the healthy choice. As we're doing that as a system standpoint, we also have to rely on those partners that are that are also taking that to the individual because we can't reach 4.7 million people one by one by one by one. We have to, to really rely and that's why the framer of live, learn, work, worship, play helps us because then we go to John and say, John, you're part of the faith community. How do we work with you so that you can also help us get the right the optimal health message out there. But I agree with you that health literacy is a huge area and there is a huge communication gap when it comes to what providers and what even individuals, community members and patients actually come forth with and really bringing that together. But it's also very complicated because we don't have enough resources that go that, that, are, that are there on the population health side. I, I would argue that we, are, we do have the resources, we're just spending them unwisely and in a very different value-based system on the healthcare delivery side. And what we need to really do is shift it over so that that prevention and that, that real population health perspective is really driving what's happening so that hopefully people are not having to go into the healthcare or the disease care system as much. So, so that's the way I would answer it, but it's a very, complicated question, but it's absolutely the right question to ask on how do we actually put the two together, because that's really what it's about. And, and I would this, actually, oh, sorry. Well, no, I was going to say, it does remind me, too, of the the challenge of misinformation, right? right. And so, Allison, do you want to speak on yeah, any of that? Yeah, absolutely I would, because I it ties right in with communications. And one thing that's really important with public health is public health communication. And the public needs to trust their public health officials and the public health system that the information that they're receiving is correct and accurate. And I'll, I'll you know, you talked about sort of healthy eating in food groups. So here's here's one issue. So I, I have found that the public they 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 understand they, they understand the concept of science, but we all know that you know when you're talking about science and evidence-based medicine, you have another study come out and another study come out, and it builds up this evidence base, and it changes over time. So our our healthcare recommendations that we take for disease care aren't the same as they were in 1950, and neither are our public health, um, you know solutions to those public health problems, they aren't the same either. Think about to sort of the USDA and the food groups. Back in 1985, there were four food groups. And then what in 1992, there was a food pyramid and there were like nine food groups. And then they redid it again a few years later and now, who know, and then it's a plate. And then it's, they change it, and so every few years they're changing it, and then sometimes the public, they're just like, well, what the heck am I supposed to eat? Because 20 years ago I was supposed to eat this, and then you said I wasn't allowed to eat eggs, and now you say I can't eat eggs, and then I couldn't eat butter, and now I'm only supposed to eat butter and no margarine. And it actually, the public, they get a little frustrated sometimes, but I also think it's just because there's a little bit of that disconnect about what we're trying to do is gather <coughs> that the best science and put it together, but make sure we're good at communicating that to the public. And sometimes there's a real gap there. And then then you have the whole problem. So that's like trying to communicate good information. Mm -hmm. And then you have the problem with actual misinformation. And um, folks might be familiar with this issue in immunizations. So back in 1998, there was a study that came out in a highly respected medical journal that linked the um, MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine with autism. Well, all, nobody could replicate this study, and then they started looking into it, and it turned out that it was completely fraudulent, the data was falsified, it was retracted 12 years later in 2010, but the damage had been done, and all this misinformation got out there, and it really spread amongst folks and online, and so folks said, well, it seemed legit when I first heard about it. It was in a peer-reviewed journal, and now who do I believe? And there's all these conspiracy theories and things like that. And so that's something that we're still dealing with. And it has real consequences because that really started a new anti-vaccine movement in the late 1990s that then they went in the anti-vaccine lobby was able to change public health laws all across the United States in 
in the 50 states, including Texas, where they, ex they expanded the ability to not follow our public health vaccination laws. So you could just opt out if you didn't feel like getting vaccinated. And, and since that time, when Texas expanded our law in 2003, our non-medical exemption um, has increased 2,300%. And we now have about 57,000 Texas school kids a year who are opting out of vaccines for non-medical reasons. Well, back in 2003, when they first passed the law, it was 2,000 kids. Mm -hmm. So it's a humongous, humongous difference. And all of that, those are real policy changes and now real health care impacts. And like you heard right here in Harris County, four cases we have of measles, you know, another in Montgomery County and down in Galveston County. And that's real life impact of the folks are getting hurt because of this misinformation that's spread online. And so it's difficult for the public a lot of times to sort of weed out what's real, what's not, who can I trust? Why do these healthcare professionals keep changing their minds about whether I can eat butter or not? You know, it makes me distrust them as well. <laughs> no, thank you for that, Alice. And we've got one other question. Yeah, sorry to backtrack a bit, but I was thinking more in terms of this investment and investing into public health. And I think we kind of have to think of that in terms of monetary. So when we started out, we were saying this is 3% of the healthcare budget is essentially what's contributed to public health. Um, but in some ways, you know, health care is really paid for by the payees, people going to the hospitals, the insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, things like that. So how do we shift those scales back to, are we saying that the payers are contributing, investing in public health? Or are we saying that, you know, our communities, our governments are investing more in public health? And kind of what does that look like in your vision? Sure. Yeah, it's mine. I'm Dr. just going to see if anybody else wants to take <laughs> it before I... Uh... <laughs> Let me just put something out there about it, because that's not my area, but I'll help get him started. Thank you. Um, so if we think about 3% of the federal budget's going to public health, but let's look at Houston and all of the money that's being invested in our parks here. Discovery Green just had its 10-year anniversary, right? Our um, transportation is always an issue, but transportation is a barrier to, for people who even have access to health care to get to the health care. Uh, I mean, it's hard enough to get to Menninger if you, have a car, if you don't have a car. <clears throat> so I'm thinking that if maybe we could reframe it a little bit, too. And I haven't seen this done yet, but, but your question prompted me to be thinking about it differently because we need to turn it around and say, we are so, um, you know, Houston is such a, a vibrant place with a lot of philanthropic dollars that are invested into other aspects of our social determinants. And so maybe that's one way to think about it. Um, I don't know. What do you think? So, uh, you know, again, it's a complicated uh, question with multiple ways that you can go. I, I think there is um, a pair aspect of this which really gets to if at the end of the day the system rewards a healthcare provider or a hospital or healthcare system for readmissions or lack of readmissions or what happens to value base to keep people healthy, that it ultimately decreases costs in that healthcare system. So ultimately, investing up front, the payer would then not be spending as much down the road if the population is healthier. So I think there is that piece of it. There's another piece of this, which then is from the actual provider or the, you know, the healthcare system, which is then the incentives that are in place to ensure that now that the payers are saying, this is how we're going to value what you do, that the, that the healthcare system starts to really say, oh, well, in order to actually get Mrs. Johnson's um, you know, readmission for CHF, congestive heart failure, to prevent that uh, readmission from happening, we need to invest in something in the community. So there's that piece now that starts to, to go in that spectrum. But then there's the governmental piece, which is, and I completely agree, not just the siloed sector of health or public health even, but all of it that goes into a community's well-being. And that's why I, I, I try, I'm... I'm starting to morph away from the word public health and really health mm -hmm. and really well-being and really resilience yeah. well, and really, because yeah. it's really markedly more than that. So if a park system is building a park and that park 
they're doing it for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, we want some input from a health you know, a, a angle perspective so that maybe we can try to give some th ideas or thoughts. At the end of the day, they're building that park and they're making it available or, or next to a neighborhood. That's an opportunity for health. And I don't really care what the park <laughs> system calls it. They can call it Jungle Gym or Jimmy John, whatever they want to call it. They can call it whatever, as long as it's being built, as long as it's there. And so we know with education, we know with jobs, we know with housing, we know with transportation, we know with all these socioeconomic conditions and who is addressing those, that regardless of how it gets addressed, that impacts health at the end of the day. So while we need to be talking, and Raquel and I have had this conversation, is it has to be bi-directional. So it can't just be thinking about when education is a social driver of health, that we also need to make the argument back that health is a, is a driver of education. And that is, is this is a bi-directional piece that is really absolutely critical. So, and there's markedly more than that. Your question earlier about the, you know, that I answered with the healthy choice being the default choice, how do our communities are built and what does that really look like and how do we really ensure that that built environment is really very much not about just, hey, let's all get in cars and drive down the street even though I'm only going a half a mile away, really, do I really want to walk in this hot, humid environment half a mile away when I could actually have the opportunity of going perhaps in a, in a, in a trolley system or a mass transit system? Absolutely. Or if I had a, you know, a, a sidewalk that's a smart sidewalk or you know, a, a complete street that I, I walk down and there are trees and there are all sorts of things and I'm walking and I'm excited. I was actually just uh, listening to this uh, recently. I, I think I challenged a couple of people about this. Is one is that, what is that low-tech um, item that uh, building uh, engineers have put in place so that when you're at an elevator, uh, you do not think that the elevator is taking that long for you for it to come down 20 floors. What? Give give an idea. What is it? Music. Okay, that's one. What? Any any? Nature scene. A mirror. A mirror. Because people love mirrors. They'll straighten up their tie. They'll straighten. They'll look at. And that elevator could take 20 hours to come down. As long as you got a mirror, you're looking. You're just doing things and all sorts of right. So we have to really be thinking sometimes of these low tech solutions that allow us for communities to really, at the end of the day, really think of health. So. I, I had to bring that in. Thank you for the, for the smile. I, I got one smile today, so I, I like that. Yeah, you wanted yeah I wanted to go back that. to what you asked, which is um, I think it's a great opportunity, especially here in Houston where we have a lot of, of innovation and technology, especially in the Texas Medical Center at TMCX, at the Johnson Johnson Labs. We held, uh, for the last two years, I'm part of a group called Ignite, and we held fire pitches there, and it is all about digital health technology, innovation. And why couldn't we do that for public health? Because somebody created that app for your, you know, how to have a balanced diet or whatever. So I would love to get something like that started here. Just to add, I I'm creating that app right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, what plug is your it name? for you. you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. I'll let you last Friday morning uh, to talk about that, just exactly that topic. Mm -hmm. It looks like we have another question from the audience. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Libby, and I just have a question. Um, it sounds to me that we're never going to get away from fixing public health 100% um, and leaving it fixed, right? We're always going to have issues that we we'll have to contend with throughout the entire rest of our lives. And the 5% or 3% that we allocate for public health seems to me something not to be proud of, but rather to, to try to change. Given that, it seems to me that the bigger problem is marketing. If, if the issue is money to increase the funds that we get allocated towards public health, which is something that we have to live with for the rest of our lives, then if it comes down to money, we need to market and promote that message far better than what we do today. Because I venture to say that 
most of the people, at least in Houston, are not aware of the very small percentage that we allocate for public health. And if we did a better job in marketing, and I mean true marketing, not just communications, not just a little bit of PR, but rather doing all the elements of marketing and a strategic plan to convey the message, cohesive message, I think marketing is very powerful if you do it right. It's costly, mm -hmm. right? Because just signage, uh, brochures, uh, TV, radio, media, if you've ever done a marketing campaign, you know how costly that can be. But it's effective if you have the right team in place. And if what we're looking for is money, which I think we should be looking for money to increase from 3% to 10%, then we have a long way to go when it comes to really putting a strong marketing plan that would last and take us from the 3% to the 10%. Again, I can't emphasize the marketing is very, very effective if you, if you allocate and give it that, that importance to it. Has that ever been discussed greatly? Yeah, and I can actually, uh, a couple of issues related to that that we've seen over the years is, um, one, I can tell you that 3% public health money, that's not a lot of money. And then when you look at how much of that money is earmarked towards marketing, it's hardly any at all. And I know that all the time, every time you get a legislative body, whether it's your Texas legislature or Congress, when they're looking at where can I cut, I'm going to cut some public health funds here, let me look at this pot of money, and they're like, marketing, what do you need marketing funds for? That's not direct health care delivery. Cut. And I mean, it happened just a few years ago with um, tobacco prevention here in the state of Texas. They were, cut, they were saying, hey, our tobacco smoking rates are going down. Let's figure out how we can take some of that money and move it over to highways. And they stripped out the um, basically these um, public marketing campaigns to try and lower the tobacco rates. Well, they had been very successful and part of the reason that we got our smoking down, but those got cut. So that's one example just historically that we've had is that it's so hard to get those marketing dollars. And then the other issue that we've had historically is content and that it's hard to market the absence of a health problem. It's hard to market we're so healthy, yay, <laughs> you know? And some, that's why we have a more difficult time in public health, at least historically, trying to get our message across, saying we did such a great job, you're not sick, versus sort of a hospital system or an emergency room can market, we'll cure you, you know, ASAP. And so those are just at least historically problems that we've come in related to that. But I agree with you 100%. If we can get that messaging right and then convince folks to invest in the marketing funds, that I think that would be great. Yeah, and I just want to add that, I mean, just think about where Nike or Coca-Cola or even uh, Best Buy would be today if they would not have taken the time and convinced their CFO yeah. to yeah. allocate uh, strong marketing dollars towards turning their company's brand. Um, again, marketing is expensive and difficult to measure a lot of times. Mm -hmm. If you hire the right marketing agency, they will bring in a team to put a message together um, and then go from there. And then they can me measure that, which yeah. is what the CFO wants, right? Even the investors behind yeah. the CFO. Yeah, well, we, we, we've invested in you know, in our department, we've invested in communications up front. In fact, uh, several, when I be became the director, that was actually one strategic area that we really invested in was comms. And really to say that we needed to not just be public information, we really need to be communication, education, engagement, really investing in brand, logos, and really looking at the value proposition of the work that we do. And our, our team that's part of our, um, that was our 1115 waiver team that eventually morphed into what we call a health impact team. It's really been out in the community, getting into um, situations of, of really showing not just visi invisibility, 
and the, and the behind, but the visibility of the work. So after Hurricane Harvey, 30 plus mobile health village, uh, villages that were set up throughout the community and now continuing to be in the community so that people see Harris County Public Health, they see public health in action and they recognize, and, and I'm not gonna call it marketing because that's, to me, uncomfortable. I'll be very honest that it may be what, where you are, and, but where I am, I really call it is raising the value proposition of the work that we do. Because I really believe strongly that if you show the value, and that's where you demonstrate visibility, that the validation comes from exactly what you're saying. I just don't call it marketing. I really call it that, that raising awareness of that value proposition, which is very complicated. But we've, I remember even in our brand logo, we were talking about Nike, the swoosh, and things of that nature. Really, what does that mean? And so our logo is now really the building blocks of a healthy community. And really, how do we get there is really one step at a time, but also one partner at a time. And, and John, I know you had a comment as well. I wanted I to make sure you said that. Yeah. Guys, I think we are very fortunate to have Dr. Shaw to be head of, of the public health in Harris County. I, I just think we ought to, I mean, this can't, <laughs> he, is, he is incredible, and we are it. very blessed. Thank you. I, all right, and I have one question. Uh-oh, now it's all right. <laughs> This is why I missed the quiz right, well, again, yeah, yeah. Okay, we are considered the most diverse city in the entire nation Community. now, they claim. Are there opportunities, but also are there challenges that you have noticed in your in your office concerning the fact that we have all these uh, diverse uh, socioeconomic group groupings now in our city? Does that make a difference? Does it does everything seem the same, or does it? Do you have to? Is there a hard way to go to certain groups that you wish you could get the word out? They're not receptive, maybe. I don't know. I'm just asking. Yeah, and you know, I, I know Allison and, and uh, Gail would have comments on this, and I w I'm very curious to hear what you have to say as well. But absolutely, our community is so diverse in so many different ways, and so you can slice it in so many different ways. And whether it's socioeconomically, or whether it's from a class standpoint, whether it's from a, a racial ethnicity standpoint, we are so diverse. And it is challenging, right? So when we're thinking about, for example, our emergency preparedness and our response messages, it has to be in English, Spanish, Mandarin, and Vietnamese at a minimum, yeah. right? So now you bring in Ebola, and you know, in the in the Western African countries, we had to bring in French. I mean, so that was another language that came. And then there may be other diseases that you start to think about Arabic or South Asian languages or other languages that are very much um, oftentimes spoken that may may that may be accentuated in a certain risk population of that particular issue that's coming up. The other piece of this is really very much about when we are out doing our activities, we recognize the fact that we can't do it alone. And so leveraging the consul here is also another strong way for us to be able to do some of these things. And then faith leaders, really, that are in communities. So we were at a, um, I guess it was about a week or two ago, we were, or, or uh, a weekend ago, we were in the Muslim community at, an, you know, at a, um, a West African uh, community that was really very much about building resilience. And so we have now invested in a community resilience officer position as well as a health equity coordinator position that's really allowing for us to take equity, health equity and equity across the system, resilience and match them together. So we're really getting into the community and really thinking about what do we do from the engagement standpoint and why is that such an important piece. But we can't, and I, I emphasize, we can't do it alone. We have to have our partners, all of you at the table, all in the room, but all those that are not even in this room to really ensure that we're really serving the entirety of our community. But Gail and, and Allison, you may have some additional thoughts about those. My uh, experience is mostly with these impoverished communities where the poverty rates are extremely high, the education rates are extremely low, and um, and so it's, it's really about not just the health literacy, but but literacy. Mm -hmm. A lot of them can't read. And so, you know, I know we've been in communities where there have been uh, 40 languages spoken. And then on top of that, layered on top of that, are uh, working with those communities that are very poor uh, and, and impoverished in many, many different ways. The family structure, where they live, how many people live in their apartment, all of those kinds of things. So it does add to the um, 
the challenge, but I also think it adds to the um, excitement about turning that into an opportunity because then what we learned is that you can work with those partners in the community that, that where you are. And so it, we might work with the ish, we might work with the immunization, we might work with public health, but really we want to work with the people in that particular community because they're the ones that can help design the interventions. And not what we think they need, but what they tell us they need. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and one other thing I'll add to all the great points that they made is it's also about cultural competency. So it's more than just translating it into one of the 50 so languages that we speak here in the Houston language or the Houston area. It's about understanding a particular community and what their particular health needs are and their level of health literacy and literacy and, um, and being able to converse with them because it's, and it goes back to communications again. Um, it's not, sometimes people think of like a public health as a, a one size fits all answer. But that's absolutely not true. We can't uh, ignore the public in public health. And to do that, we have to go into the community, find out what are the needs in, even if it's a discrete area like a zip code or a block or a, a cultural group in a, in a neighborhood, because they're going to have different needs than maybe folks just a mile or so down the road. And it's our responsibility as folks who are here to protect the public's health to make sure we understand those needs, that then we can come up with solutions to those public health issues and then communicate with the public um, to try and get those issues solved. So hands down, we're in a very diverse community, lots of challenges that come with that from language to cultural competency. I'm curious of this perspective, the spiritual perspective and the diversity when it comes to many religions and um, what we in public health, healthcare and other sectors can do to become more competent when it comes to engaging um, along those lines where there's, again, so much diversity from a religious standpoint. Every fall at the Institute, we have uh, the World Religion Series. We take the five great world religions, but by the same token, now we realize we need to expand that even more and uh, determine to be able to communicate. We call it, we don't call it uh, cultural competency. We call it, you could almost say cultural incompetency <laughs> because we really don't know each other. But the beautiful thing is, you know, if I, lived, if I had stayed in Shreveport, Louisiana the rest of my life, 98% of the people were Christian. Uh, I guess the 2% were Jewish, and that was it. And I came to Houston, and uh, for the first time in my life, you know, I've really been exposed to people of other traditions, and I found beautiful, loving people in every single religious tradition. And it breaks down all kinds of walls. I feel like that is probably the most important single thing we can do today is to bring down those walls that separate us as far as our as our race our religion all the all the barriers need to come down as quickly as they can and they are they're coming down I've, you know even uh, the gender differences are evaporating around us we see it so that is very important um, as far as uh, what i've done Personally, is uh, as you know, as many of you may know, the inter interfaith um, ministry has a dialogue, uh, a dinner dialogue, several times a year, and you go there and you go to somebody's home that's of the other faith system. So you actually are right there with them, and they share their faith, and you share yours. Very powerful thing. We also become very close to a Muslim group uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Down on Highway 59, there's, there's a, a group that we've become close to. I've been to many of their uh, meals, you know, uh, Ramadan meals. They've come into my home. We've invited them to come to us, and we share and find just beautiful people everywhere. I think that is probably one of the most important single things we can do in a city that's so diverse instead of keeping separated. I love the fact that downtown ethnic groups will have a, they'll, they'll have their food out, they'll have dances, they'll be in their clothes. You know, we keep our uniqueness. We don't have to lose that. 
but we do need to talk to one another. We need to communicate as you're saying. And when you do that, you find out we are very much the same no matter what. And our value systems down at the bottom are pretty much the same. Family is very important to all of us, and those value systems come out of it. You know, on Friday I was at a, a, a panel on climate health symposium at the Rothko Chapel, and yeah. uh, I was representing body. Um, there was mind, body, and spirit. Yeah. And uh, there was a Native American who was actually spirit, and it was really interesting because the person who was mind and the person who was body, me, were separated by this individual in between us who was mm-hmm. spirit. And as he spoke, and I kid you not, and by the way, we're very fortunate to have someone like John and what his leadership brings to our community, the richness of our community, as we are all of our panelists here because they're fantastic. What I recognized was the fact that um, he said something really interesting is that we're so busy talking that we've forgotten that we need to be listening. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing to really hear this bridge of the spirit between the mind, because we all think a lot of things in the body, and we all say a lot of things, but really what's the spirit behind all of that? And so I really just wanted to, to say that as well. Yeah. It's really important. Thank you. So this really feels like a conversation over dinner. It, <laughs> and the only thing that's missing is bread. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to just thank everyone for participating in uh, this evening's session. Too bad we couldn't go on even more. I feel like we've just sort of scratched the surface on some very exciting topics. Um, so if you could please give our panel a round of applause. Again, happy to serve as your moderator. Hope to serve as your moderator again for the next year. And in the meantime, have a great evening. Thank you.